Look out at the skyline of St. Petersburg, Russia, and it's hard not to notice that something has changed. There are flags, Russian flags, everywhere. Uh, only I can see the flags, Russian flags, on every building, on the school, on the libraries, everywhere. So, for patriotism? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think so. That's Stanislav. He owns a marketing business in St. Petersburg, and he specializes in search engine optimization. He asked us just to use his first name. He's 37 years old, bearded, and shaves his head. And he's been noticing a lot of changes around him lately, like this big Z symbol that popped up about a month ago. The, the, the Z sign, like Zorro? He first saw that big Zorro-like Z painted on the tanks rumbling across the border into Ukraine. And now he sees it everywhere, on stickers, on dusty car windshields, and then most recently stylishly inserted into words on state TV, and even on the jersey of a Russian Olympian. It was supposed to be a sign of unity. I'm with you, it is meant to say, and you and I are supporting the fight against the Ukrainian government. Stanislav, who's half Russian, half Ukrainian, says it all feels more sinister than that. But it means uh, you are watching for the, the war, you're supporting it. But it is the same like uh, German swastik, swastiks, I don't know. Swastika, yeah. I think for me, it, it is the same. This is supposed to bring Russians together, but Stanislav finds it unsettling. Our kids are in uh, private school now, but in the government schools, there is one hour of patriotic education, yes. Yeah. Patriotic education, he says. They are talking about like why uh, it's not a war, but and this is like a special operation to uh, free the uh, Ukraine and so on, so on. This seems to be telling him something about his future. But maybe the biggest challenge for Stanislav are the changes he's seeing in his bank account. The the problem is uh, my business was generating for me like six. A uh, thousand euro per month for me and my family. He was getting paid in rubles, but now business is down, way down. But now uh, it's four, not six. In one uh, month, I expect some clients will uh, stop the marketing budgets. Stanislav is struggling to survive in an economy that the world is shunning. Visa and MasterCard have frozen Russian credit card transactions. The value of the ruble has fallen by nearly a half. And if things keep going this way, he doesn't know how he can survive. You will, you will just pay with this money for the apartment, some food, and that's it. So it's like, it, it, was, it, it wouldn't be comfortable. So Stanislav has to work around an economy in mid-collapse. And his solution? I'm into cryptocurrency. I have some uh, knowledge of how to use it. I'm Dina Temple Raston, and this is Click Here, a podcast about all things cyber and intelligence. Today, cryptocurrency's big moment. For years, advocates have claimed that digital currencies would democratize the global marketplace and pave the way for finance without the man. That theory is now being tested in a way it never has before, in Russia. Stay with us. Stanislav wasn't the only one noticing the unsettling signs of change in St. Petersburg. All his friends were too, and they were leaving. It is very hard when you see that all your friends 90% 90% of your friends who understand what's going on are in shock. I think already five or six families of mine are already left the country by car, by airplane. He said it's scary because he can't leave. His wife is nine months pregnant and she can't travel. And this just isn't the way they envisioned these last months playing out. So I cannot fly. We cannot use the car to cross the border. And also there are some problems with the payments. What he means is sanctions are making it impossible for him to get paid. Because I have some clients from uh, Netherlands, from Israel, 
uh, they even cannot pay for my services right now because my bank is blocked by sanctions. Uh, so I'm trying to find the solution. And that solution is crypto, currencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Unlike other financial institutions, crypto exchanges have chosen not to suspend service in Russia. They say they've stayed so that everyday Russians, like Stanislav, can try to keep going even under sanctions. It's been helping with small things. Crypto lets Stanislav pay for Netflix or his company's Slack subscription. But it's just a stopgap measure because crypto isn't really designed to pay monthly bills. There are commissions and transaction fees, and it gets pricey. If you're trying to transfer someone uh, $1,000, you can spend about $30 or $40 for the commission. So it is a bit expensive, but uh, like if you don't have any other option, why don't you? So running a small business on crypto is a bit of a pain. But for Russians who are leaving with no intention of returning, converting all their ruble savings into a digital currency can be a godsend. A Western Union money transfer on steroids. Which has led to another change in Stanislav's life. He's become a kind of crypto guru, teaching friends and family how to use digital currencies. Case in point, his sister. She left Russia weeks ago, and she's in Egypt with his mom. So I'm trying to explain to her how to use and some other uh, friends of mine. He's explaining digital wallets, how to set up foreign debit cards, how to put Bitcoin into overseas accounts. You take some rubles here, rub, rubles here. Uh, you buy some uh, USDT uh, on Binance. USDT. That's a cryptocurrency that's pegged to the US dollar. And Binance is an online cryptocurrency exchange. You can use a peer-to-peer. Essentially, you know a guy who knows a guy who will trade crypto with you. Even you can go to the cafe and just sit with him and uh, you will send them the transaction and they will give you cash. It's working for his sister in Egypt. He's been sending her money there. Uh, and now I'm trying to help my sister to have a job from outside of the country. But she only has bank accounts in Russia, which are blocked from international transactions. So even if she finds a job, her paychecks can't go into a regular account. So the only way is for us to use the cryptocurrency. But as we said before, cryptocurrency is a temporary fix. It helps his sister while she tries to get set up in Egypt. But Stanislav can't really go invoice to invoice and paycheck to paycheck using only crypto. And things look like they're going to get worse before they get better. The quality of, uh, of my life here uh, will be radically decreased. So you cannot buy the parts for your car. You cannot buy things for a newborn. You cannot buy any furniture. We are decreasing like 20 years. And while crypto isn't an ideal solution for Stanislav and his business, there is one group it could be perfect for, oligarchs. When we come back, why Russia's super rich are in love with crypto. Stay with us. When the United States dropped massive historic sanctions on Russia, it was targeting people who were supporting Russian President Vladimir Putin. People like the oligarchs, Russia's super rich who need access to the world economy. So if you're a Russian oligarch, you're a billionaire, you have goods and services you want to sell, there are lots of things you want to buy. You want to buy parts for your, your yacht that you hopefully for you has not been seized. You need to, to pay off your mistress in Paris uh, and, and pay for her apartment. That's Alex Stamos from Stanford University's Internet Observatory and the Krebs Stamos Group. And he says all this makes sense. With the sanctions in place, you can't use the traditional banking system to do all that. So you turn to crypto. And people are finding crypto wallets that seem to be full of oligarch money. How they're moving the money is under investigation. But the thinking is that they're tapping into a very specific group of Russians who have the skill set to help them, the local ransomware gangs. They've been collecting ransoms in cryptocurrency for years. They know how the system works, and they know how to cover their tracks. So if you're a well-connected oligarch... Maybe you get hooked up with somebody who has experience laundering Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies based upon ransomware. 
But the U.S. Treasury, which is trying to enforce these sanctions, has gotten wise to this and actually keeps a list of suspicious wallet numbers and tracks them. And so I, I think one of the things that folks are have to keep a, an eye on is a pattern of transactions where money is being moved from many, many different smaller wallets that have never existed before and then start to get consolidated. Which makes you wonder if crypto can help Stanislav keep his family fed and help oligarchs, at least for now, can it work for a whole economy? The short answer is no. The reason? Cryptocurrency exchanges just can't handle that kind of volume. I don't think the infrastructure is there to have the crypto ecosystem, especially in Russia, sort of become an alternate financial universe that uh, is used by the state or by entities to transact. That's Juan Zarati. He set up a sanctions and anti-money laundering office at the U.S. Treasury after 9-11. And he says he can't see how cryptocurrency exchanges could possibly process enough transactions to keep an entire economy humming, even if there weren't sanctions in place. In fact, no one has even attempted to do that for a sector of the economy, though people are thinking about it. More about that in a minute. It's very hard, I think, to do it uh, systemically and at scale and the way that the Russians would need. You know, that might be possible in three, four, five years from now, but it's not possible now. There's another big reason why crypto isn't going to help Russia work around sanctions, and we alluded to it before. While there's something underworldly and kind of mysterious about crypto, its transactions are very transparent. Every trade is recorded on an electronic ledger, known as the blockchain, and everyone can see it. That's why authorities are finding oligarch wallets and why they believe they would spot any wholesale Russian attempt to use crypto to get around sanctions. But Stamos says all of this is really uncharted territory. We've never just unplugged a major world economy, and there are bound to be surprises. We don't really have any examples of taking such an important part of the economy and then turning them into North Korea. And uh, just the amount of money sloshing around and kind of the deep integrations here, I think, pose a huge host of challenges even outside the cryptocurrency world. Last week, Russia announced that it might be willing to accept Bitcoin from friendly countries as payment for its oil and gas exports. That's the head of a committee on energy in the Duma. And he says Russia is willing to be more flexible about the way it gets paid. Kind of like Stanislav was willing to be. Though he's pretty realistic about what lies ahead. He knows he has to leave with his family and start somewhere else. Uh, maybe, maybe in two, three months, if the border should be open, to go somewhere to a neutral site like Turkey. Well, uh, this is it. This is it. Uh, no, no happy news. No optimism right now. What I have to do with what I can right now. Okay, that's it. Bye. This is Click Here. We're going to take a step back from Russia and the Ukraine for a moment to discuss another big name in cyber news this past week. A rather unlikely one, actually. I'm talking about Grimes. Her real name is Claire Boucher. She's a Canadian musician, on-again, off-again girlfriend to Elon Musk, and apparently, if she's to be believed, the person behind a pretty infamous hack in the indie music world. Oh yeah, okay, so this one's funny because I always wanted to tell the story about this one. Back in the day, like before, like the woke era, like I actually got canceled for this, which is so That's Grimes during a Vanity Fair interview earlier this month. And the this she's referring to is a photograph of her kissing another woman at a party. It appeared in the celebrity gossip blog Hipster Runoff about 10 years ago, and it went viral, which upset Grimes. My career and it was like Grimes gone wild or something. It was just this like The reason we're telling this story is because of what happened next. Grimes says she talked to a computer-savvy friend and... Anyway, we were actually able to DDoS hipster runoff and um, basically blackmail them. We were like, like we're not going to let you run your, put your site back up until you take the story down. And he did, in fact, take the story down. And it was like my coolest hacker moment. I was just absolutely floored to hear her 
essentially admitting to a crime and doing so in such a nonchalant manner. That's Jackie Singh. She works in information security and writes a blog called Hacking But Legal. It was impressive, to be honest. It didn't really seem like she understood what it was that she was sharing with the world. But here's the thing. Even though Grimes has more than a million followers on social media and the Vanity Fair interview was up for about a week, no one really reacted to the news, except for Jackie Singh, who decided to write about it. Well, she used the word blackmail, which is a little bit farther and really a different characterization of this incident beyond the dis- the denial of service or distributed denial of service that she indicated that she was involved in. So to put this all in context, back in the 2000s, the hipster runoff blog was a big deal. It called itself the blog worth blogging about. And it made fun of alternative culture and the indie music world, sometimes in a mean way. Think TMZ, but a blog. The person running the site was pseudonymous, and so they would um, attack celebrities and um, local indie music scene artists and essentially pass judgment on them in a way that maybe wasn't very nice uh, and had racist and sexist overtones. Then the blog took aim at Grimes, not just with that photo we mentioned before, but with other things too. Some of the headlines were quite ugly. Things like, Ohio school shooting teen T.J. Lane listened to Grimes. Has fringe indie become the sound of teen angst? And then the hipster runoff blog got hacked. And not in a small way. It wasn't just a simple distributed denial of service attack. The hack did some real damage. There were signs of foul play on the server. The disk had crashed. The remote backups were sabotaged all of their previous backups of the site, all of the data that they had, all of the posts on the site had been removed. They had to completely redo the site. They had to use a new server and rebuild from scratch. So, um, and then eventually the site uh, got sold very soon after that. And there are some other clues that suggest that Grimes isn't just making up this cool hacker moment. After the hack, the blog seemed to avoid covering her altogether. From April 2012 all the way through to October 2013, based on the posts I saw on archive.org and the searches I performed, I wasn't able to find anything else about Grimes. And so it kind of seemed like she became a topic that they wouldn't touch, which, in my opinion, lends some credence to the thought that they may have actually been blackmailed. For years, the question of who hacked and helped shut down hipster runoff was a lingering question. And now, 10 years later, we come to find out that Grimes says it was her. And so it's pretty interesting that someone who's ranting about cancel culture and wokeness had taken it upon herself to essentially apply cancel culture to someone else by force. Here are some of the important cyber and intelligence headlines this week. The Justice Department unsealed indictments against four Russian nationals, revealing a widespread campaign to hack energy companies around the world. The men used Triton malware on a refinery's Schneider Electric safety systems between May and September 2017, and then took aim at the industrial control systems of a number of global energy facilities. Their intention was to physically damage them. Mustang Panda, the advanced persistent threat group that made a name for itself hacking the Vatican a couple of years ago, is at it again. ESET Research found the group targeted research entities, internet service providers, and European diplomatic missions located in East and Southeast Asia. And to entice their victims, Panda used files that promised the latest news in Ukraine, changes to COVID-19 travel restrictions, and an update on regulations from the European Parliament. The Senate Armed Services Committee has advanced President Joe Biden's pick to lead the U.S. Army Cyber Command. The record first reported in December that Biden would select Major General Maria Barrett as the first female chief of the service's digital warfare unit. Her nomination is winding its way through the approval process. And finally, the White House continues to warn U.S. companies that they could be in the crosshairs for a cyber attack from Russia. 
Deputy National Security Advisor Ann Neuberger called on U.S. companies to gird themselves. The steps that are needed to lock our digital doors need to be done across every sector of critical infrastructure. And even those sectors that we do not see any specific threat intelligence for, we truly want those sectors to double down and do the work that's needed. Today's episode was produced by Will Jarvis and Sean Powers. And it was edited by Lou Olkowski, with fact-checking from Darren Ancrum. Ben Levingston composed our theme and original music for the episode. We had additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Click Here is a production of The Record Media, and we want to hear from you. Please leave us a review and rating wherever you get your podcasts. And you can connect with us at clickhereshow.com. And just because we love this original composition so much, we'll go out with Ben Levingston's crypto theme. I'm Dina Temple-Reston. We'll be back on Tuesday.